the subject of today's session is admittedly a very difficult chapter in the Torah, in the Book of Numbers. Difficult both because of the complexities of the story and because it's a very painful episode with much tragedy. I'm referring, of course, to Numbers chapter 16, the rebellion of Korach, Dathan, and Abiram. Let's review the basic plot of the story, at least briefly, as the basis for our discussion. So we begin, of course, at the beginning of chapter 16 with verse 1. Now Korach, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kahath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelet, sons of Reuben, took, well, the text doesn't say men, but that's presumably the simple meaning. It becomes clear that indeed they came with additional men, because in verse 2 we read, and they rose up in face of Moses with certain of the people of Israel, 250 men. They were princes of the congregation, the elect men of the assembly, men of renown. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. This dual attack against both of them is of very great significance when we consider the rest of the story. And they said to them, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and God is among them. Why then do you lift up yourselves above the assembly of God? So this is the complaint. Obviously, we're going to have to consider this complaint much more deeply a little bit later today, because... It has obvious ramifications in our understanding just who is holy. But let's consider for now the continuation of the story, specifically the reaction of Moses. In verse 4, when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Now, I must admit, the text doesn't tell us just what he was doing when he fell upon his face. That is, are we referring to prayer? Are we referring to communing with God? Are we referring possibly to communing with himself? Because the continuation, which is Moses' reaction to the rebels, could be a direct prophecy, a communion with God. It could be what Moses as God's faithful servant, may have come to realize was the appropriate response through his own efforts. In any case, after that initial reaction in which he falls upon his face, in verse 5, he spoke to Korach and to all his company, saying, In the morning, God will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him, as we'll see, the one who is chosen, to come near unto him. Even him whom he may choose will he cause to come near to him. And how will that choice become obvious? Verse 6. This do. Take you censers, Korach and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense upon them before God tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom God chooses, he shall be holy. You take too much upon you, you sons of Levi. So what this amounts to is what we could describe as an incense showdown. That is, each one of them will take a censer, a fire pan, put up incense, and each one of them will attempt to offer that incense. And as we may well recall, we'll return to this in a moment, we've been in a similar scenario. In fact, all of them were witnesses to a similar scenario 
apparently just a few months before. But more on that shortly. That is reaction number one. And it's important for us to note that there are two distinct reactions to the rebellion that we see here. The first is the incense showdown. The second emerges in the continuation of chapter 16. This is explicitly by divine command, because we read beginning in verse 23, God spoke unto Moses saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the dwelling of Korach, Datan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went to Datan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away in all their sins, which obviously already intimates their doom. So they got up from the dwelling of Korach, Datan, and Aviram on every side, and Datan and Aviram came out and stood at the door of their tents, brazenly, with their wives and their sons and their little ones. And Moses said, in verse 28, Hereby you shall know that God has sent me to do all these works, and that I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, and be visited after the visitation of all men, then God has not sent me. But if God makes a new thing and the ground opens her mouth and swallows them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down alive into the pit, into the grave, then you shall understand that these men have provoked God. And what we read in the following verses is the dire consequences of both the incense showdown and what Moses just warned of the earth opening up its mouth. In verse 31, and it came to pass as he made an end of speaking all these words that the ground did cleave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men that appertained unto Korach and all their goods. So they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, into the grave. And the earth closed upon them, and they were lost from among the assembly. That was, of course, the conclusion of the second response. And as for the first response, the incense showdown, in verse 35 we read, And a fire went forth from God and devoured the 250 men who offered the incense. So... Certainly, a painful, dire, tragic conclusion to a very unsettling episode. First question we need to ask is, why these two distinct reactions? Why the incense showdown on the one hand and the earth swallowing up the rebels on the other? And I think it's important for us to appreciate at the outset that there were implicit in the words of the rebels, two distinct challenges. That is, obviously, there was a challenge with respect to the priesthood of Aaron. That's clear. And it was, of course, to that end that Moses's challenge to the rebels is the incense showdown. Because offering incense is not only something that is a specifically designated performance, a task of the priests and of no one else. It's also something that everyone already knows needs to be done exclusively by dint of God's command. And in the absence of God's command, the consequences can be downright lethal. Of course, inevitably we recall what happened to Nadav and Avihu. We discussed this some time ago in Leviticus chapter 10 on the day of dedication of the tabernacle. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, and Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, took each of them his censer and put fire therein, laid incense thereon, sounds very similar, doesn't it? 
and offered strange fire before God, which he had not commanded them. And of course, as we've noted, that last phrase is the most critical. God had not commanded them. And the consequence. They went forth fire from before God and devoured them and they died before God. When you consider in that light, Numbers chapter 16, verse 35, and fire went forth from God and devoured the 250 men that offered the incense. Boy, sure sounds familiar. And of course, inevitably, the connection between these two passages is by no means incidental. True, we don't have any indication that Nadav and Abihu were attempting to usurp the role of their father. But what is significant here is incense as a very loaded task in the tabernacle. You don't do what you are not commanded to do. And of course, in this regard, we'll stress in particular the background of Nadav Avihu, when Moses proposes this incense showdown to the 250 rebels, that is, were we to ask, doesn't Moses warn them of the potentially lethal consequences of what they're about to do? To which our response is, this is a pretty transparent reference to what happened to Nadav and Avihu. By common reckoning, although the timetable with respect to Korach's rebellion is not stated in Scripture, by all appearances, it was just a few months after Nadav and Avihu perished. It was deliberately a transparent allusion to what happened to them. They were warned, and they knew the consequences. Now, again, this is challenge number one. Challenge to Aaron's priesthood. But there is another challenge, a more insidious challenge, a more fundamental challenge, a challenge that seems to have been particularly championed by Datan and Aviram when they gripe about Moses taking them into a barren wilderness and not into a land of milk and honey. Namely, the challenge that Moses is not really acting on behalf of God. He's an imposter. He's acting on his own authority. He's done these things by himself. Now that, obviously, undermines not only some specific set of appointments by Moses, that undermines Moses' entire mission, that undermines his entire role as the conduit of God's word to Israel and the world. And that is why the forewarning to Dathan and Aviram and their cohorts. Again, verse 29, if these men die the common death of all men and be visited after the visitation of all men, then God has not sent me. And in context, I think we would well understand God has not sent me, again, not only with respect to the specific appointments, but with respect to the entire mission. But if God did send me, then you are hereby warned. God makes a new thing, and the ground opens her mouth and swallows them up with all that I pertain to them, and they go down alive into the grave then you shall understand, then they shall understand that they have provoked God. They too are warned. They explicitly. Now, with respect to the challenge to Aaron's priesthood, and again in particular, the realization that the priests serve exclusively by force of God's command, even among the priests, because Nadav and Abihu were priests, doing anything that is contrary to God's command can be lethal. The incense showdown, the example of Nadav and Abihu, is exquisitely apropos, measure for measure, 
in teaching the lesson of the consequences of challenging the priesthood. What about the earth swallowing up Datan and Aviram and their cohorts? Unlike in the case of the incense showdown, I don't have some precedent to invoke to demonstrate what the significance of the earth swallowing them up is. I don't have a precedent, but I do have another story. We've seen this story in the past. I think it's especially germane for us to review it right now because it certainly bears directly on that challenge to authority. The second book of Chronicles, chapter 26, when we read about the rise and tragic fall of the righteous King Uzziah, King of Judah. In verse three, 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was upright in the eyes of God. And he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the vision of God. And as long as he sought God, God made him prosper. A reign of 52 years. It's a long time. It gives a king, a benevolent king, an upright king, an opportunity to not only make grand plans, but also carry them out. And although... I haven't included the intervening 10 verses, verse 6 through verse 15 here. It's all subsumed within the ellipsis at the end of verse 5. There's a very detailed description in Chronicles of all of the wondrous exploits and prodigious successes of King Uzziah. God made him prosper indeed. But then we get to verse 16. The tragic denouement. When he was strong, his heart was lifted up so that he did corruptly. And he trespassed against God, his Lord. For he came into the temple of God to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah, the priest, as we see in verse 20, is the chief priest, came in after him. And with him, 80 priests of God who were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It pertains not unto you, Uzziah, to burn incense unto God, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated. It pertains to burn incense. That's their role. It's not for the kings. God's command reigns supreme. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You are violating God's word. Neither shall it be for your honor, from God the Lord. Verse 19, then Uzziah was wroth, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the English translation renders it as leprosy. As we've noted in the past, leprosy is undoubtedly a poor translation. The Hebrew tzarath is not merely a biological pathology. It is a spiritual malaise that carries with it as detailed in the Torah, a state of severe spiritual defilement, utterly incompatible with being inside the precincts of the temple. The Tzarath broke forth in his forehead before the priests in the house of God beside the altar of incense. This defilement is so completely beyond the pale in the precincts of the temple. Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous, again, mitzora, the condition of tzarat, in his forehead. And they thrust him out quickly from thence. They threw him out of there, and he himself made haste also to go out. He realized he was finished, because God had stricken him. This story doesn't have a happy ending. Uzziah, was stricken with Tzarat for the rest of his life. That was the end of his great success and prosperity. Now, on the one hand, you undoubtedly can appreciate that this story is 
relevant with respect to violating God's command, but um, of what relevance is it with respect to Moses's second reaction and its consequence, the earth swallowing up the rebels? I have to admit that's not explicit in scripture, but maybe it's implicit. And we certainly have an ancient tradition that connects the dots, that makes the connection. The implicit evidence emerges from the words of the three prophets of disparate circumstances and different contexts. The first is in the opening verse of the prophecy of Amos who tells us that he prophesied in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, also in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. But with respect to in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, at the end of that verse we read, it was two years before the earthquake. Now, we don't know too much about this earthquake, other than to describe a cataclysm in the eternal scriptures as the earthquake arguably implies that it was severe. There is one other explicit reference to this earthquake in scripture. And that is in the final chapter of the prophet Zechariah. You'll recall that in chapter 14 of Zechariah, he describes the final battle of the nations against God, fought here in Jerusalem. And when the nations will have arisen against God and against Israel here in Jerusalem, we read in verse 3, Then shall God go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. Verse 4 describes what we can only call a geological cataclysm. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Obviously, that's an anthropomorphism, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleft. The mountain splits in two. So there shall be a very great valley and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Obviously, a cataclysm that splits a mountain in half like this is a very severe quaking of the earth. And in verse 5 we read, You shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Atzal, Yea, you shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Now, besides, again, referring to the earthquake, there is implicitly an indication of just how severe this cataclysm was when we consider Who is writing these words? Zechariah, you'll recall, was a prophet in the second temple, prophesying over two centuries after Uzziah. Furthermore, not only have over two centuries elapsed, exile to Babylon and return to the land of Israel have taken place in the interim. If he can refer to the way you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, to people who were born over 200 years after that earthquake had taken place, clearly it left an indelible mark etched in the national consciousness. Now, at this point, we've just talked about the fact that there was an earthquake in the reign of King Uzziah. Of course, scripture tells us nothing further regarding the circumstances of that earthquake. At least, again, nothing further explicitly. But there is one additional passage, which we've already had occasion to discuss in the past. 
And that pertains to the beginning of Isaiah chapter 6, which clearly emerges, as we've discussed in our series on Isaiah, as the inaugural prophecy of the prophet Isaiah. The prophecy begins in the year that King Uzziah died. Does that mean he actually died? Or does that mean his career died? Because stricken with Sarath meant the end of his career. It meant his son had to succeed him instantly as king, and he was finished. Conceivably, being stricken with Tsarath can be regarded as tantamount to death itself. Of course, again, the text only tells us this was in the year in which Uzziah died. But we have an ancient tradition that it wasn't just in the year. What Isaiah is describing is precisely that moment when Uzziah enters the temple to offer incense brazenly upon the incense altar despite God's command. Isaiah, our tradition tells us, is standing inside the temple at that very moment. Because what he describes is clearly his view of the temple. I saw God sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So, of course, the vision of God is prophetic. The vision of the temple may well be actual. Above him stood the seraphim, and in verse 3 we read, one called unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And verse 4, and the posts of the door were moved at the voice of them that called, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, of course, we could understand the imagery here as symbolic or metaphorical, but we could also understand it as quite literal. The doorposts were moving. They were shaking. This is a description of the earthquake. The house was filled with smoke. Perhaps the incense altar shook, and a plume of smoke rose from upon the altar and filled the house. Perhaps, maybe the prophet is describing plaster raining down from the ceiling and the walls, like smoke. But then, again, this verse could well be a description of the earthquake. So again, while this is not explicit in scripture, connecting the dots, our ancient tradition tells us that, indeed, what Isaiah witnessed was the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah, to which Amos and much later Zechariah make reference. And it was, as he explicitly describes it, a consequence of the voice of them that called. A kind of terrestrial response to the heavenly call of the angels. Holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Because there's someone who right now is violating that holiness, violating that glory, attempting to blur the distinctions, attempting to violate the order, the structure that God established. Because part of that structure is priests bring the incense upon the incense altar, not kings. Uzziah, by doing what he did, is violating the divine order that establishes the respective authorities of king and priest, and the earth responds by violating its order. It quakes, literally, and the earthquake results. So, of course, in that vein, considering this as a kind of parallel narrative to what we see in our passage, 
we could say that just as Uziah, by his violation of God's command, by his not conceding the establishment of clear boundary lines by God, provoked the earthquake, so too Korach, Dathan, and Aviram, by their actions, by their rebellion, by their not merely thwarting Moses' command, but by their impugning his authority, have likewise violated the boundaries that God established, violated the system, the order, and the earth responds likewise, violating its order, opening up its mouth, and swallowing them up. So again, we have two responses to punishments, because there were these two underlying themes of the rebellion. Both were reflections of the same basic problem, recognizing that God established rules, and the earth operates based upon those rules, and we do too. And we ignore those rules at our peril. Now, this obviously is a crucial first-level message to get from the story of this rebellion. But, you know, simultaneously, we can't really help but ask, is this all? I mean, after all, do we really need all of this elaboration in a story that pertains to an episode, a rebellion that took place thousands of years ago in the wilderness of Sinai? How does it relate to us? Besides, again, the obvious message that we need to obey what God commands, what message are we to glean from this story? And I think it's important for us to appreciate that we've considered in the last half hour three different episodes in the Bible. The one that is our principal focus, the rebellion of Korach, the story of Nadav and Avihu, and the story of King Uziah. Tantalizingly, there is a deep common denominator that we can discern in addition among all three of these tales. And that in brief, there's a story all about good intentions. Now, the narrative in which the good intentions are most explicit is that of Nadav and Avihu. What we read again in Leviticus chapter 10. And while in the initial description of the crime, there's nothing stated overtly about those good intentions. We should consider first, in chapter 10, verse 2, they died before God, which implies not merely a uh, geographical closeness, but that they were truly in God's presence when they died. And much more explicitly, in the following verse, then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that which God spoke, saying, Through them that are near unto me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Moses is saying to Aaron, Nadav and Avihu were the ones, the ones who were closest to God. Even more than you and I. And Aaron accepted these words of comfort from his brother because he too knew they were true. And indeed, when we read of the deaths of Aaron's sons again at the beginning of chapter 16 in Leviticus, that emphasis once again 
after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before God, they died. Again, not merely geographically. They were drawing near to God. And in their drawing near before God, they died. Their intention was to draw close. They did what God had forbidden. The fire that they brought, God had not commanded. But the intention was to come close. Now, admittedly, in the story of King Uzziah, this isn't stated anywhere. But I will still submit to you that it may well be implicit. Again, remember, we read in verse 4, he did that which was upright in the eyes of God. And in verse 5, that he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the vision of God, and as long as he sought God, God made him prosper. Now, with that background, how do we understand the mentality that motivates King Uzziah to come into the temple to burn incense upon the altar of incense? Couldn't he think of something else to do? But inevitably, I think we realize the implication of the text is after experiencing such prosperity, such blessing, such bounty, he's looking for a way of saying thank you. He wants to express his gratitude to God. And he wants to express that gratitude by coming into the temple to burn incense upon the altar of incense. But again, God said no. Only the priests are authorized to do that, not the kings. He sinned. He sinned and he prayed grievously for that sin. But again, when we ask what were his intentions, his intentions may well have been laudable. But then, as we noted a while ago, in particular in speaking of the deaths of Nadav and Avihu, recall the words of Dante from the Divine Comedy. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so, Nadav and Avihu perish. Uziah is smitten with Tzarath. All good intentions. Now, in the wake of these two examples, we return to the rebellion. And in particular, we return to the key line of the rebels. That what they say against Moses and Aaron is, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. Every one of them. And God is among them. Why are you lording it over everyone else? And inevitably we ask, well, isn't it true? Isn't all the congregation holy? And, of course, it's important for us to stress here that when we read of Moses' reaction, it certainly isn't because Moses doesn't like having any competition. That is, we should stress first in the words of Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. The man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were upon the face of the earth. So Moses is certainly not an egotist. And indeed, in particular with respect to the prospect of competition, we read perhaps even more explicitly in Numbers chapter 11. The story of Eldad and Medad, beginning in verse 26. There remained two men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, the name of the other was Medad, and the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were recorded, but had not gone out unto the tent, and they prophesied in the camp. So here Eldad and Medad are prophesying on their own. And they ran a young man and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua immediately responds, my Lord Moses, shut them in. How dare they? How dare they arrogate to themselves the role of prophet, which is your job? Shut them in. And Moses' response, are you zealous for my sake? 
but that all of God's people were prophets, that God would be spared upon them, upon them all. So Moses is the last person to seek any kind of unique level of exclusivity, excluding everyone else. And inevitably then, we need to ask, how indeed should we respond to that argument, that charge, that everyone is holy? In particular, before we consider the charge in itself, there are also two additional components of the story of the rebellion upon which we need to focus our attention. Because they both seem completely enigmatic and as most apparent enigmas are key to understanding what's really taking place in this story. In Numbers chapter 17, we read at the beginning of the chapter of an extraordinary command that God gives Moses. From verse 2 and on, speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the fire pans out of the burning and scatter the fire yonder, for they are become holy. How ironic. After the rebels talked about everyone being holy, God says the fire pans are holy. The fire pans are holy? Why? And he continues, even the fire pans of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives, and let them be made beaten plates for a covering of the altar. For they are become holy because they were offered before God, that they may be a sign unto the people of Israel. And of course, inevitably, our question is, what? Why should they be holy? They were instruments of sin. They were the implements used by the rebels in rebelling against God. What kind of holiness should pertain to these fire pans? And yet, they are indeed beaten into a covering for the altar, implying there was something holy about these rebels. That's our first enigma. The second one emerges in the continuation of chapter 17, where we read of the final episode with respect to this rebellion. And when I stress that it's the final episode, what I'm really stressing is it seems, frankly, anticlimactic. From verse 16 and on, God spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of them staffs, one for each father's house of all their princes, according to their father's houses, twelve staffs, you shall write every man's name upon his staff. And you shall write Aaron's name upon the staff of Levi, for there shall be one staff for the head of their father's houses. And lay them in the tent of meeting. And in verse 20, it shall come to pass that the man whom I shall choose, his staff shall bud. And I will make the cease for me the murmurings of the people of Israel, which they murmur against you. That's going to make the murmuring cease? Why? I mean, with all due respect, it's a nice miracle that a dead stick, because it's placed in the tent of meeting, in the tabernacle, and because of God's miracle, buds, blossoms, and bears fruit. That's what we read, after all, in verse 23. That's what happened. It came to pass on the morrow that Moses came into the tent of testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and put forth buds and bloomed blossoms and bore ripe almonds. Great. But these people had just seen a fire come down from heaven and consume the 250 rebels who were bringing incense. They saw the earth open up its mouth and swallow the rebels, Dathan, Aviram, and everything that was with them. After miracles of that magnitude, a dead stick blooming, it seems so anticlimactic. Why should this be so significant? Why altogether is it here? So these two additional passages in Numbers chapter 17 necessarily are going to 
need to be resolved. We need to focus our attention upon them, and we'll be returning to them shortly. Again, both the fire pans becoming holy, despite the fact that they were implements of sin, and the showdown of the staffs, that the staff that has Aaron's name on it blossoms and bears fruit. What's going on? Again, we return to the protest of the rebels. Everyone is holy. And again, we note this claim isn't only a defensible one, it seems to be unassailable. We have numerous passages in the Torah that indeed speak of that holiness. To review them very quickly, in Exodus chapter 22, you shall be holy men unto me. In Leviticus chapter 19, you shall be holy. In Numbers chapter 15, be holy unto your God. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, for you are a holy people. And later on in the same chapter, once again, for you are a holy people unto God your Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, that you may be a holy people unto God your Lord. And finally, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God will establish you for a holy people unto himself. I realize for the sake of brevity, that was a rapid fire succession. And while it was calculated to have an almost booming effect, because you hear one after another, a crescendo of holiness, holiness, holiness. What I just did is a classic example of taking verses completely out of context in order to create an impression that is not only incomplete, but is in fact completely wrong. Diametrically opposed, in fact, to the message that really emerges from these passages. Because the way I read them, it sounded like holiness is a gift, a blessing, a privilege that God is bestowing. Where in fact, in each of these instances, it is a challenge. It is a summons. God has expectations. And that's precisely the emphasis. Now going through this list seriously. Exodus chapter 22, verse 30. You shall be holy men unto me. That's a summons. And the way it expresses itself is... Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field. Cast it to the dogs. You don't eat like an animal. Why? Because you have a summons. A summons to be holy men unto God. In Leviticus chapter 19, even more so. The command. Yes, it's a command. You shall be holy. For I, God your Lord, am holy. Is a preface to a long list of specific commandments. I didn't include them here in order to save time and space. But all these commandments, manifestly, are parts of how you show your fulfillment of this divine command. You shall be holy. It's not a promise. It's a command. In Numbers chapter 15, the context in which we see this summons to be holy unto your God is the commandment of making fringes in the corners of our garments. In the Hebrew, the tzitzit. And the purpose of the tzitzit is in verse 39, to remember all the commandments of God and do them. Verse 40, that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. How do you become holy? By doing all my commandments. It's a summons. It's a command. That's how you attain holiness. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, where we saw the theme of holiness expressed twice, that indeed is exactly the context. That is, in chapter 14, verse 1, you are children of God your Lord. You shall not cut yourselves nor make any boldness between your eyes for the dead. These excessive mourning practices of cutting one's flesh 
or tearing out one's hair. The Torah forbids. Why? For you are a holy people unto God your Lord. So, why the mourning? Because you are grieving over the sad fate of the one who is gone. Your children unto God your Lord. He's returned home to his father. And if you're grieving because of your loneliness, because you're left alone, you're also a child of God your Lord. You still have your father. He's never leaving you. So in that context, then, you are a holy people unto God your Lord. Behave yourselves appropriately because your holiness then is a summons. And in particular, what follows, much as we saw it in Exodus chapter 22 as well, is eat as an expression of that holiness. Verse 3, you shall not eat any abominable thing. And there's a long list of the prohibitions that pertain to the subject of eating. Culminating in verse 21, you shall not eat anything that dies of itself. Why? For you are a holy people unto God your Lord. Again, your being holy is not a privilege. It's a summons. You have a job to do. You have responsibilities because of that holiness. Similarly, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, in what vein does God affirm that you are a holy people? You have vouched God this day to be your God and that you would walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his ordinances and hearken unto his voice. And God is about you this day to be his own treasure, his specially designated royal property as he spoke to you, and that you should keep all his commandments. This is all in the context of keeping God's word, keeping the commandments. Now, in verse 19, to make you high above all the nations that he made in praise and name and in glory, We've discussed elsewhere in praise, in name, and in glory, not of you, but of God. Because by your keeping the commandments, by your living up to the summons to be light unto the nations, you are to project that message of godliness, of praise, name, and glory to the entire world. And that you may be a holy people unto God your Lord, as he has spoken. That's your responsibility. And perhaps most of all, the culmination of this progression in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In verses 1 and 2, it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of God your Lord, to observe, to do all his commandments, which I command you this day. What's the consequence of that? Verse 2, God will establish you for a holy people unto himself. If you shall keep the commandments of God your Lord to walk in his ways. In other words, the holiness is consequent to you are doing what you need to do. Not a blessing, not a privilege, not a promise. A responsibility, a summons. And of course, inevitably, we realize this makes all the difference. Because if being holy is a free gift, carte blanche, if being holy is, again, simply the promise, the privilege, the gift, the blessing, if that's all it is, then indeed, who needs leaders? We're all holy. We're fine. We can manage on our own. But if you realize that, on the contrary, this is a summons what you need is leaders to guide you, to teach you, to show you how to actualize that holiness in your life. Well, that, of course, is precisely the role of Aaron and the priests generally. That is, as we've noted elsewhere, the priests only served in the temple approximately two weeks a year. After all, after King David divides up the priests into 24 watches. Each 
watch serves once per cycle, approximately twice a year, for two weeks in all. What do they do the rest of the time? That's clear, after all, in God summons the priests. They were teachers. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, besides what you do in the tent of meeting, that's the service in the tabernacle, in the sanctuary, in the temple, but that you may separate between the holy and the common and between the defiled and the pure, and that you may teach the people of Israel all the statutes that God has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Likewise, in Moses' final blessing, in his blessing to the tribe of Levi, but it becomes clear that in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 10, He's speaking in particular to the priests. They shall teach Jacob your ordinances, your laws, judgments, and Israel, your Torah, your teaching. Now, they also put incense before you because they are the priests. But the primary role is to be the teachers. We see this expressed in the prophets as well. Ezekiel, who of course was himself one of the priests, addresses the priests in chapter 44, the priests, the Levites, the sons of Tzadok, in verse 15. And in the continuation, in verse 23, we read, And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and cause them to discern between the defiled and the pure. Sounds almost exactly like Leviticus chapter 10, doesn't it? Now, again, they obviously have their service in the holy temple. That's the previous part of the chapter, in verses 15 and 16 in particular, but they're there to be teachers. And finally, the prophet Malachi, last of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, dedicates chapter 2 to the priests. Now this commandment is for you, O you priests. Verse 5, my covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him and of fear and because of my name he was overawed. The Torah of truth what is in his mouth and unrighteousness was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips keep knowledge, and they seek the Torah at his mouth, teaching at his mouth. For he is a messenger of the God of hosts. We could read messenger also as in the Hebrew, Malach, an angel of the God of hosts. I think it's especially noteworthy that the covenant with the priests is a covenant of life and peace. And it may be helpful here to consider an alternative metaphor with respect to the role of the priests. Again, the claim of the rebels is everyone is holy. Implicit in that is everyone is the same thing. So if everyone is the same thing, we don't need leaders. But you know, if we can take a lesson from biology, when all of the cells of an organism are just the same thing, an undifferentiated mass of cells is what we call a tumor. For an organism to function properly, every cell is a specialist ordered into different, different tissue types, organized in various organs. Every single cell has a special role to play. Now, one of the ironies of that is that in all familiar life forms, that is all multicellular organisms, that means that the individual cells have given up the ability to sustain themselves. So what keeps all the cells alive? You have a heart, a heart that pumps 
life-giving blood through the entire organism. That's the biological analogy. The analog spiritually is every individual is here for a mission. No, we're not all the same. Because everyone's mission is unique. We all have a distinctive, singular calling like no one else. And as we pursue that calling, we are liable to lose the connection, or at the very least, to dim the light of that spiritual source. Who's going to ensure that we all remain always connected to the source of spiritual vitality, to God, the teachers, the priests. And so my covenant was with him of life and peace because that's really the basis of life itself for everyone. We need the teachers, obviously, not for their sake, certainly not for God's sake, for our sake, in order to remain connected. Now, ultimately, indeed, the goal is that teachers should be successful. And when teachers are truly successful, they can retire. In Yoel chapter 3, we read, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. I'm pouring out my spirit on everyone. But we're not there yet. Note that these words really do signify the fruition of Moses' prayer, his hope. As we saw it in Numbers chapter 11, verse 29, would that all God's people were prophets, God would put his spirit upon them. And indeed, at that stage, no need for any teachers. As we read in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 32 and 33, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says God. I will put my Torah in their midst, and in their heart will I write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And there shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No God, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says God. What an exalted vision where indeed there is complete fulfillment of that demand. Everyone's holy. It is ultimately fulfilled. Just not yet. In the meantime, we need teachers. We need leaders to show us the way to get there. And maybe that enables us to understand why the showdown of the sticks. <laughs> because it is specifically after the stick of Aaron blooms, buds, and bears fruit that we read in the continuation of Numbers chapter 17, verse 27, the people of Israel spoke unto Moses saying, behold, we perish. We are lost. We are all lost. Everyone that comes near, that comes near unto the tabernacle of God is to die. Shall we wholly perish? You really sense the sincere remorse, the sincere contrition on the part of the people here. And we can't help but ask, why did it take until here? Why the rebellions? Why after the rebels are incinerated in the fire coming down from heaven and devoured when the earth opens up its mouth, is there yet another rebellion of the people with more casualties? Didn't they learn? And if they didn't learn from such dramatic miracles, why should these sticks teach them anything new? And perhaps the answer is because 
until this last sign of the stick of Aaron blossoming and bearing fruit. Perhaps we could excuse the people of Israel for concluding from what they had seen with the earth swallowing up and the fire coming down and devouring. That this obedience to Moses and acceptance of Aaron's priesthood, boy, it's not any good for us, but you better keep quiet and accept it. Because these miracles just bludgeon us into submission. Accept it or else. But God's message to them really wasn't accept it or else. Again, as I said a few minutes ago, when we realize that this is all for our own good. It's not for Moses, it's not for Aaron, certainly not for God, it's for us. To enable us to become spiritually alive. What is the most apt illustration of that spiritual vitality that comes specifically from having the leaders, having the teachers, having the spiritual heart pumping the spiritual lifeblood through us all. It's a dead stick. So long as it's connected to God's word. In the tabernacle. It blooms and comes back to life and bears fruit. So too we. And finally they get the lesson. They realize. It's not for them, it's for us. They realize what we're doing, we're the ones who are going to be lost. We're the ones who are going to perish. We need you. We need leaders, teachers. We need you to bring us God's word, to guide us, to show us the way. Now, at this point, obviously, we get an idea of what the message of the rebellion and its consequences was. But admittedly, at this point, so far, we've been talking in the explicit terms of Scripture exclusively about internal divisions that are taking place within the nation of Israel. That's, after all, the focus here the priests, with respect to the rest of the nation. It is at this juncture that it's important, I feel, for us to broaden the canvas. To recall not only the microcosm of Israel, but the macrocosm of the whole world. So it is in that vein that first we recall what God's charge was. What mission he gave Israel at Sinai. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will hearken unto my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own treasure. Again, Sigula, specially designated royal property. From among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. All the earth is mine. And I'm concerned about everyone on earth. And I have a mission for you on behalf of everyone else, for all the earth is mine. And they all are my children. They all command my attention. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. There it is, holy again. The holy in what context? Being the kingdom of priests, just as the priests are charged with teaching Israel, Israel is charged with bringing the kingdom of priests to teach the world, to be the light of the nations, to illuminate the darkness. Isaiah tells us it's going to happen. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 6, you shall be named the priests of God. Men shall call you the ministers of our Lord. This is in the world of the future, and clearly the men who are calling you Israel ministers of our Lord, aren't Israel. 
the whole world comes to this realization. Because after all, isn't this true of the entire world? That everyone is here for a reason. No one is created by God without a mission. No individual, no nation. Everyone has a role to play. But then again, there's a need to ensure that as everyone goes about fulfilling his unique mission, living up to his unique destiny, that you don't lose sight of the source of the spiritual vitality. So you need the kingdom of priests, the holy nation, the priests of God to teach the world. Now, this is all still in a relatively limited context. But this overview would be woefully incomplete if we didn't add to it the words of Isaiah in the final chapter of Isaiah, where we read from verse 18 and on, I will gather all nations and all tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory. And, verse 19, they shall declare my glory among the nations. Verse 20, they shall bring all your brethren out of all the nations for an offering unto God. So all the nations bring Israel back. And the culmination. In verse 21, and of them also will I take for the priests and for the Levites, says God. Of them also? Of whom? But of course, in context, the answer sure becomes clear. Of them, for all appearances means, of them who are brought and of them who are bringing. Because everyone has a role to play. Because ultimately, that holiness engulfs the entire world. The entire world returns to God. Ultimately. Again, we're not there yet. The words of the rebels, everyone is holy, contain the kernel of truth. That may be the good intention that underlied their crime as well. It was still a crime. Again, good intentions can pave a road to hell. But still, the truth ultimately comes to fruition. It wasn't at the right time. So what do you do when you have a seed with potential, but the potential isn't yet actual? It's not ready to be actualized yet. What do you do? You bury it in the ground. When it's the right time and the appropriate circumstances, it will sprout. As we read in Psalm 85, in verse 12, truth sprouts out of the earth. That truth will ultimately be realized. The message of the rebellion of Korach, Datan, and Aviram, and its consequences, is a truth that will be actualized when everyone realizes everyone is holy. We need to work toward that goal. That goal, as expressed in Isaiah chapter 11, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God as waters cover the seabed. And it shall come to pass in that day that the root of Jesse that stands for an ensign of the peoples, unto him, shall nations seek, and his resting place will be glorious. So this is a summons, a mission, and it remains a mission for each and every one of us. To appreciate this goal, it's not a facile promise, but it is an ultimate destiny. Through what we do, the choices we make, the lives that we live, 
to make ourselves holy, to prepare ourselves to receive God's Spirit, to become vessels for godliness, to serve as the conduits through which God summons, God's commands are fulfilled. Ultimately, when we do that, we reach the goal of everyone is holy. And the message that was first articulated under such unfortunate circumstances by the rebels becomes truth and retain his blessings. God bless you.